Hey everyone, so we know that whenever we talk about the conflict going on in the land of Israel, that the claim that keeps coming up these days is the claim of genocide, that Israel is perpetrating a genocide against the Palestinian people. Now, these claims kind of come out of media outlets, it comes from all sorts of places, but when we talk to the experts who actually know what urban warfare looks like, the numbers are actually not even near what one would think of as a genocide. Take a look over here at this interview, this discussion between Jordan Peterson and John Spencer. John Spencer is considered one of the top, most knowledgeable voices in the entire field of urban warfare. So take a look at this conversation. Uh, we'll watch it together. You'll learn quite a lot. Take a look. What Israel is doing and has done. So. They're fighting yeah. urban warfare, you said, with a 15 to 1 disadvantage, yes. fundamentally. Now, my understanding is that the IDF is doing what it can do to minimize non-combatant targets. Do you, do you believe that that's the case? Are I, they... I've written with evidence that Israel is doing more to prevent civilian casualties than any military has done in the history of war. Okay, okay, okay. So you think that's valid. So what sort of things do they do to, to, to make that a reality? Sure. And this is why I went back in February. Like I wanted to see it uh, uh, for myself. Yeah. Not just the what the access to information that everybody else has. I wanted to ask them, like, how are you doing this? Yeah. Um, given the complexity of a, a combatant who uses the human sacrifice. Yeah. Strategy. Right. So the number one thing that people have done, although again, I, the the strategy to win wars is to do it rapidly. Right. So. Uh, and is that also because opposition to the war mounts as sure. it, yeah, as it's protracted? Because war is politics. Right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So the more dragged out it is, the more dragged out a victory, the more costly it yeah. is on the public relations side. That's right. I mean, because the losers start to look like victims. Right. Or if they yeah. have, I mean, this is Ukraine had to hold for a while. It, it, it had to slow Russia down from achieving an overwhelming coup de main, which is overthrow the government. And, and the fight's over. Right, right. So it's always to get in there and rapidly achieve your goals. Yeah. Uh, if you can slow the army down, then all these other political elements. Set. Sure. What Israel did, though, was implemented things to prevent civilian harm. After October 7th, they waited three weeks before they entered Gaza. Right. They did evacuation. That is the overwhelming number one thing that any military has ever done in the history of war to prevent civilian harm is evacuate cities. Although you... Well, and that's a very strange thing in this situation because yes. the city is the target. Uh, this was the misnomer, too, that I saw that Gaza is the densest place on Earth. I saw that on October 8th. And I study cities for a living. Like, mm -hmm. they're not even, it's not even in the top 100. Mm -hmm. it, it, has, it, is, it has 10 massive cities, a total of 24 cities, um, that are very dense. But there's also... It's not one continuous urban area. But you are right that in... Anywhere I've studied, there's never been a population trapped in the combat area. Although in the 2016-17 Battle of Mosul, a city of a million, the Iraqi government told the civilians to stay in the city. Yeah. 850,000 of them to stay in the city during the battle because they didn't have a place for them to go. Eventually, they told them to go out. But because of Egypt, the Palestinian people of Gaza had nowhere to go. Right. So Israel— Can you explain that? Yep. Why did the Palestinians have no place to go because of Egypt? And there's a long history there um, to include the city Rafa that used to be on both sides, uh, and, and that Egypt that history escapes our campuses. Like yeah, yeah, you might say that. Yeah, that, that Egypt if destroyed the homes of 100,000 people on their side and evacuated all those people because there were a bunch of smuggling tunnels going in between and terrorism on their side. Right. They don't want a radical, radicalized population. Right, so they don't want to bring in the Palestinian right, right, right. right. Well, it is the case, if I've got this right, that the Arab world in general has refused to take Palestinian refugees in any great numbers. Right. That, that is the case. 100%. And this is the reason, the reason that you just described. Depending on what nation you're talking about, absolutely. Some say it's because they don't want a forced displacement. So yeah. they, they use that as an excuse. But for Egypt, it's very clear. Okay. They share the border with Gaza. Okay. It would so, be very easy for them to open that side up of the Sinai, and, and these kids need to look on the map. I mean, where Egypt is in this giant desert of, called the Sinai, yeah. there makes it, it is not rational to say that Egypt couldn't have opened their side up, created a humanitarian zone outside of the combat area. 
it's just not rational. So where did the Palestinian refugees that Israel allowed to escape go? They went to a place that Israel established, and nobody's asked this question, like, why did Israel create the al Mawasi humanitarian zone on the southwestern edge of Gaza? Because yeah, right, it, I haven't even heard of that. Yeah, that's the, the giant over a million people humanitarian tent zone that Israel designated in October for all the displaced people to go. Okay. Because it's the one area they knew Hamas did not have immense defensive positions set up. Like I, I see, I see, I see. So how did Israel ensure that when all the refugees went to this zone that hadn't been militarized, let's say, by Hamas, that it wouldn't just be as infiltrated by Hamas as Gaza itself is? Like, So how do they know that the refugees are refugees and not military combatants? How? Great. It, it's a I mean, good question. I know you have the, some of them identified, but yep. okay. It's a good question. Initially, little control. So yeah, right, this, okay, this is where, because it was quick. Yeah, um, Israel did move forward and split Gaza in half along the what's called the Wadi Gaza. This is a river that splits Gaza almost in half. I mean, it's, it's, it's 25 miles, but they split in half. 850,000, which is actually an effective metric of ev evacuations. So the world said you can't do it. I don't know if you remember that. When Israel announced evacuations to protect civilian life before they moved in to get their hostages and destroy Hamas, the world said you can't do that. You can't evacuate a million people. And that literally was the statement from the United Nations and others. You mm -hmm. can't do that. Mm -hmm. Israel did it and mm -hmm. successfully evacuated 850,000 below that. But you're right. Many Hamas leadership and hostages were moved during that time. As Israel was allowing for the protection of civilians, rather than like other militaries invading a territory, do it with overwhelming force to achieve your right. quickly. quickly. Right, quickly. right, right. And so they took the risk of the hit on the public relations side. Because they know from their own history that they have to keep international will, even after yeah. October 7th, yeah. international will and the United States, who started making recommendations on day one of what Israel could or couldn't do. You're right. Like right. the, Israel wanted to go in with a larger force, and, and there was rec, you know discussions at the political level, all wars, politics. You can't go in with five divisions. You have to use four divisions. And now we're in Rafa. You can't go in with two divisions. You got to go in with one division. That's what you saw. But Israel learned. So Israel did. By the time I visited in, in Khan Yunus, interesting, as we go through all the metrics and all the things that Israel has done that no military has done in history, I, am, I went in with the division commander who talked to me about basically the political atmosphere was that you had to bring the civilian casualties to zero. There's literally what the statements were, which would mean the war needs to stop. Mm -hmm. So you had a division in Gaza, in Khan Yunus, which is a, another Hamas strong point, doing operations with the overwhelming backdrop of you can't have, to have a civilian casualty. So they did what, an example of how they prevented that, basically the migration of Hamas, although it's still inaccurate to say that that migration is not showing Israel is successful because dismantling the military means taking away its military capability. Mm -hmm. So Hamas wasn't moving with its 20,000 rockets. Right. It wasn't moving with its deep buried military weapons production plants. Yeah, okay. In all its weapons supplies. So and clear that and discover it. And this is why- So at least they're disarmed. That's right. Even if they're there. Yeah. There's okay. still gonna be tens of thousands of okay. radicalized who people. Did, who didn't go along with the evacuation on the Palestinian side because they had the option. So now the simple-minded yep. consequence of what you said, my understanding of that would be that, well, Israel gave the civilian population ample time to clear out yes. many people. Okay, so now if Israel goes into, um, into Hamas territory, yep. into the Gaza, and there are civilians there that are being killed, who, like those are people who didn't leave or couldn't leave. Okay, so... Or, or, or yeah, or, or, or forced not to leave. Hamas okay. also didn't allow their own population to leave. How, how much of their own population? It's hard to measure. A, a, any approximate? I mean, 850,000 that did it, but leaves, you know, 250,000 or 150,000 still there. Okay, those, okay 150,000 still there. Still there. Right. Who, but... This is, the, again, because I've studied every urban battle has ever happened. There's always about 10% that stay. Uh-huh. Okay, a, so that's not that's not, not historically not, abnormal. But it How is did Hamas abnormal for Hamas to set up checkpoints 
um, to, to not to, let people to go. not let people let people to fire from the humanitarian safe route. So this is standard too. Yeah. Evacuate the cities, create the road that yeah. you want them to use. Hamas would put rockets next to that so they could use media to say Israel is striking the zones that they told people to, to leave. That's a fact. That's how. Right. Right. I see. Okay. So there's 150,000 people left. Okay. So then Israel moves in. Yep. Okay. So what, what do they, how do you move in? What does that look like? Building by building fighting? Like, what, what does that look like? What's that like for the people who are on the ground? Yeah, it starts with, like any military would, striking known military locations. Okay, so that's airstrikes, fundamentally. Strikes. That's, okay, okay. That's, like, that's standard military operation, to include in urban warfare. If you know there's an enemy bunker or an enemy headquarters or an enemy formation, you would always want to strike them as far away as you can, especially if yeah. you've done everything to move civilians out of harm's right. way possible. Right, right, This is the idea of like the 2,000 pound bomb you can't use in an urban area, which they're actually saying, it doesn't matter if there's zero civilians there, you can't use that bomb. Oh, urban. right, okay. Well, that's obviously a propaganda maneuver. So, okay, so, so one advantage of clearing the civilians out then would be that there would be, in principle, fewer your ability to use. So why doesn't, why don't the, Hamas forces just move everything that they have into the tunnels. I imagine they did that to some degree. This is why they have 400 miles of tunnels. Right, right. Uh, so why have anything available to be bombed? So this is what I faced. When I went there in December and interviewed brigade commanders that were fighting there, they would have a two-week battle on a single block yeah. because Hamas wasn't in the buildings. They were underneath, running in a— Right. In 400 miles in a stretch of only— There are layers— and, and webs of tunnels underneath at varying depths. It, it was it's so hard to imagine. I've never studied that. We call it the three-dimensional war, but uh -huh. to, to know, I, so this is a funny thing about me going into Khan Yunus. Uh, I was in Khan Yunus, a lot less activity, but I was taken to a location where they were searching for a tunnel. And, and later that they found that tunnel, I was standing on top of an uncleared Hamas tunnel mm -hmm. on the surface. Mm -hmm. And that's what the IDF faced every moment, every step they took into Gaza. And then the houses were I, you know, basically rigged to blow. There were absolutely mm -hmm. Hamas left behind. And this is why Northern Gaza was chosen first. It was the military strong point of Hamas, of its battalions with assigned geographic areas to hold with a vast tunnel network of caches all throughout the urban terrain. Same thing that you would teach somebody to do. If okay, so this whole tunnel network, it was produced over what period of time? At least 15 years. 15 years. And but so there were some present already when the ID, while the IDF were there, before they gave up Gaza and gave it to okay. the Palestinian people. So it, it was obviously prepared under the assumption that Israel would eventually move in. Yes. Okay. But it and wasn't for the purpose, again, their defensive tactics. So they spent 15 years, which is unique in urban warfare, to prepare their terrain for solely military defense, but not to, because defenders usually lose. All they had to do was hold the IDF long enough for the international community right. in the United States. To, to turn. To turn them Yeah, on. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. okay. So that dictated the tactics. And they the knew tactics. that. Absolutely. It's been the strategy. The okay. tunnels. okay. I wrote this article, you know, war is a contest of politics, but I wrote the article in like November, like this, this is the first war I've studied where the underground is more important than the surface. Right, right. Because the, the Hamas are in the tunnels. The hostages are in the tunnels. The tunnels are the key sure. methodology to achieve the strategy. Sure, sure, it, sure. Well, how effective has been, how effective has, be, has is Israel's invasion of Gaza been then if the Hamas terrorists can just retreat to the tunnels and have, have all the tunnels been identified or does anyone even know that? Yeah. Well, since they knew, since the, the, and I study underground warfare as well, I was doing underground warfare conferences in Israel in 2018 in Hezbollah tunnels and Hamas tunnels. Um, no, they don't, they don't even know how many tunnels. Were yeah. There. Right. Now the estimate went from 300 miles to 400 miles, but they found tunnels that they couldn't have imagined just the size of them, the depth of them, how effective had they been at finding and destroying? Yeah. Right? Is it possible to destroy them all? Right. But if they're so dug underneath every structure in Gaza, they're not going to destroy them all. They've had to make critical decisions on which ones to destroy. And there's not enough explosive in the world. to do. So they've made really tough decisions mm -hmm. on which ones they find to destroy 
And how to destroy it. it mainly because they, they tried this flooding thing for a little while. Yeah. Which it didn't work. Hmm. I thought it was a really innovative attempt. It actually worked for Egypt along the Egypt-Gaza border to flood the tunnels because they were made of sand and it kind of collapsed down. Oh, yeah. But these are billions of dollars, Jordan, used that would have gone to the Palestinian people. Right. Billions of dollars to use to build these. And that's aid money? Yeah. Well, and money that they take from, you know, they basically, um, the market that they drive up the prices and Hamas takes that money. So both direct aid money given to Hamas, but also Hamas's subjugation of its population into poverty involves the population having What to about pay funding Hamas. from places like Iran, the direct funding for the construction of the tunnels? Is that also part of the strategy? Absolutely. But Iran has helped in many ways. Yeah. Uh, but again, what and what what do you make of of the knowledge of the international community, let's say the UN, for example, with regard to the presence of these tunnels? I mean, how much of the fact that these tunnels existed has come? Who has it come as a surprise to and who knew? So this is the, the idea of who is the United Nations? Yeah, there there's a good question. Or who is UNRWA, the yeah. United Nations organization in in the Palestinian areas, right? So in Gaza. The UN voice in Gaza is UNRWA. So we're rational people that like have facts and can make deductions off facts. If there are Hamas data centers underneath UNRWA headquarters, or if there's Hamas tunnels underneath UNRWA facilities, schools, hospitals, but UNRWA, who has been there for 15 years, says that we did not know about that. Mm -hmm. To me, that doesn't make logical sense. Well, it's either a confession of incompetence or malevolence. It's one of the two. Because how could you not know? It, it, it's just a lie. I mean, of course you knew. Um, this gets the idea of where do we get information from, guys. Yeah. So Hamas is the ruling power, has been the ruling power for 15 years. And you can't work in Gaza, much like the Ba'ath regime in Iraq, unless you're a member of Hamas. Mm -hmm. And you could not be like a radicalized martyr, you know, fundamentalist Hamas. But you can bet your dollar you can't say anything without the threat to your life if you don't even believe in the ideology. This mm -hmm. gets to our number of civilian casualties, mm -hmm. like the Gaza Health Ministry, which is the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry, and that we will believe their word yeah. without even questioning to where we have the national leaders of the world parroting the number, which I tell you as a scholar of this, there is no number. Like there's no way to know how many civilians have, are dying on a daily basis down to a single digit, period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or that nobody will acknowledge that the Gaza Health Ministry provides a number to the world that, according to them, includes every death that happens in Gaza, no matter the cost. Right, right, right. So it doesn't right. matter if it was a Hamas rocket that landed on a house, since 20% of the 13,000 rockets Hamas has, let, has fired have landed in Gaza. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter if that death was caused by Hamas. And the Hamas number also includes any reported missing person, whether it's a social media post or a family member saying, I don't know where this person is. That goes on Hamas's list of dead personnel. Mm -hmm. But the world just runs with 37,000 Palestinian. Right. And I've seen that number radically adjusted right. multiple times, which is an indication of its, well, of its comparative reliability. But this gets to the college kids that, yeah, like, just know what the number is. The number is every death that's happened in Gaza, no matter the cost. You know, and I've had some friends who've been looking at the social media warfare end of this, who are trying to understand what information the college kids who are protesting are getting and why they believe it. And TikTok in particular is flooded with images that suggest that the IDF are barbarians beyond belief and that the casualty rates are extremely high. And once you click on one of those, then that's all you get in your feed. And that seems to be particularly effective. The use of imagery of injured children, for example, seems to be particularly effective for women. And of course, the majority of the protesters on the Ivy League campuses are women. And so they're the targets of this particular PSYOP. And so that's another... It's a dream for Russia right, to have this yeah. access to the youth's minds. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's Russia, it China, and Iran. It's right. a dream that they had this access in an algorithm yeah. that feeds it. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to do the work. Yeah, right. The algorithm Absolutely. feeds it. There's yeah. actually a battle in my work in, in urban warfare history where the United States was defeated because of this. The first battle of Fallujah, I don't know if you remember that, but 
There were four American contractors that were killed in the city of Fallujah in April of 2004. The U.S. president ordered, because they dismembered American citizens, uh, burned them all and hung them from the bridge. US, oh, yes. Yep. Um, remember that? Yeah. The U.S. president ordered the Marines to go in and get those responsible for that action. So the, the Marine Corps, over their objections, launched an operation. Al Jazeera was sitting in the hospital airing photos of children that had been casualties of the operations and trumping up numbers of civilian casualties, unverifiable. Mm -hmm. And six days into the battle, the Iraqi governing council, the U.S. allies all threatened to disband if the United States didn't stop its battle. That was a, a, a basically an echo to what we have today, uh -huh. where you can defeat a superior power easily through the use of information warfare, the pictures of children. Like, why did those resonate? I know that's your field of study. Like, that resonates very strongly to include me. Yeah, of course. I don't want to, I have children. I don't want to see any children. I've seen children, and this again goes back to the, even these kids won't acknowledge what Hamas is. When I well, watch, children are the ultimate victims, yes. right? The ultimate innocent victims. And so if you're playing a victim victimizer ideological game, then obviously pictures of hurt children are effect, incredibly effective weapons in that regard. And of course, if there is a war, there's going to be hurt children. So it's, it's a strategy that's very difficult to counter. That's for sure. But there's an ideology that the IDF would do it purposely. When... I can show you the video of October 7th where Hamas psychopaths, like, it's yeah. like Jeffrey Dahmer's, yeah. were standing over m children making a death moan and laughing over top of them. Yeah. I've been in war and seen children injured, and every individual, doesn't matter who he wants, is dying in their heart to help them. So the idea that the IDF would purposely harm a child isn't backed up by evidence. Mm -hmm. Now, do civilians get caught in between two warring factions, yes. But despite, going back to our statement, that the IDF have done everything anybody's ever thought of and created ways that nobody's ever thought of. I mean, they have drones with speakers, going back to drones, that go into enemy-held territory and announce to the civilian, please leave, this is a combat area. They've used technology back every cell phone in an area now, whether it's on or off, to know if there's civilians there, and they won't even allow their military into that area until a certain population gets out. So uh, I think this was a very well done, methodical assessment. Number one, the claim of genocide. Number two, the identity, true identity of the UN. And number three, the social media war, the TikTok war, and how pictures, images, and whatnot are used to manipulate public opinion in order to uh, be leveraged against Israel. I, I think that this is an extraordinarily well done and well thought out um, assessment of, of all of the uh, factors and, and uh, areas that are going on in the land of Israel as we speak. And certainly every civilian death, every civilian casualty is a tragedy. Uh, and the responsibility for all of it rests squarely on Hamas. <laughs>